good evening, everyone. We have the screen on here because we have a special guest from Ghana who's going to join us through a, a DVD um, video, which we'll watch later. But welcome to this um, the seventh annual celebration in connection with the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. The Ethics Program, my name's Mark Dorley, for those of you who don't know who I am. I'm the director of the Ethics Program, and I'm the MC this evening. <clears throat> so the Ethics Program in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences inaugurated this annual event in the spring of 2007. Our goal was simple. I hope we're going to be able to pull this back up. Okay. Our goal was simple, recognize and celebrate an individual for his or her outstanding commitment to the ethical ideals of his or her profession. We have been fortunate to have amazing people come to spend time with us and to receive this award. With Ms. Jennifer Staple Clark, God continues to bless us with extraordinary people. I am grateful, very grateful that all of you are here to help us to celebrate our honoree and to support the vision of the Praxis Award. I'm the MC, so I'm not supposed to talk too long, and I'm not going to be funny, so too bad. But I do want to point out particular people for a word of gratitude. This event would not be possible without the financial support and sponsorship of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Nursing, the College of Engineering, and the Villanova School of Business. So to the deans of those colleges, Dean Linney, Dean Fitzpatrick, who, who sent her uh, regrets, Dean Gabriel and Dean McGiddy, thank you, my deepest appreciation for your generosity and support. I also need to recognize that Father Peter Donahue's here, our president, and also Father Ellis, our vice president for academic affairs, so I thank you both for, for joining us. I want to recognize my ethics program colleagues, uh, Professors Mark Wilson, Cynthia Nielsen, uh, Peter Wicks, and Brett Wilmot. And we also have students here from a couple of organizations. Which I'm so uh, excited that they're here with us. We have uh, Benjamin Lawrence, who's with the Villanova Engineers Without Borders, um, the Villanova Business, Villanova's Business Without Borders group, Aaron Deegan, Felicia Preson, and Daniel Newell are here and representatives from the Nurses Without Borders. So each college has its own without borders. So what's going on with the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences? <laughs> the, the, the liberal philosophy without borders. <laughs> um, I wasn't supposed to be funny, but anyway. Um, Elizabeth Beagle and Kelsey Yassing. I wasn't funny, thank you. <laughs> so so this, to the students, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I also want everyone, if you please, not that we can't applaud everybody that I just mentioned, but uh, we need to applaud Mrs. Mary Coulter because uh, she's responsible for all the details of this event and it wouldn't have happened. Without her. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank our student workers in ethics, Arveli, Escobar, Justin Salvador, and Ashley Martinez, who have us who have, as always, provided Mrs. Culture with ready assistance for this event. So at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Jean Ann Linney, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, to, um, to address us about the Praxis Award. Well, I actually want to, um, to welcome everyone and, um, and thank the committee for working hard and, and, and um, selecting a wonderful recipient again this year. As Mark said, this is the seventh um, annual Praxis Award. And, and I have to say, as, um, as a relative newcomer to Villanova, in my mind, this award really embodies what Villanova is about. It is, um, as Mark said, it's about the professional practice of sort of doing the right thing. And um, one of my dear friends, uh, who is also an academic administrator, has a little sign on the, on the side of his file cabinet that only he can see. But if you're allowed behind his desk, you can see this. And, and it says, um, managers do things right. Leaders do the right thing. And I think this Praxis Award really represents someone who does the right thing and applies um, their talents to making the world a better place. So we here at Villanova talk about creating leaders, educating leaders, who will do the right thing, make change, make the world a better place. 
And, and that's really why I think this award embodies everything that the winner will represent. So I am delighted to congratulate Jennifer and, and thank her for being here to tell us about the work that she's doing. Um, I, I do want to say, as a psychologist, most of us don't realize how important vision is in the development of every human being's life. We, um, there are so many uh, visual diseases or diseases of the eye that are easily treatable and go undetected. And particularly in, uh, in countries that don't have uh, systematically clean water or um, certain kinds of vitamins in their diet, vision is seriously impaired. And you know, we think about um, all of the, the ways that we need, what, the ways that we benefit from sight. Um, we were talking earlier about particularly in the United States, we, we lament all of the problems that we have in our school system. A, a very significant percentage of children can't learn to read because they can't see well enough to, uh, to differentiate the letters. And as Jennifer was saying, you'll often see, children, see individuals who will use their finger to uh, follow along, and often that's just a way to try to focus their, you know, all of their, their visual energy on being able to see what's there. So the work that, um, you know, that, 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 um, that Unite for Sight is doing is, is just has endless benefits, human benefits, economic benefits, um, and again, something that is about doing the right thing. So congratulations and thank you for being here. Thank you, Dean Linney. Before we get to the presentation of the award, I'd like to explain briefly the selection process. So each spring of the academic year, we seek nominations for the following year's award. In fact, the call for nominations for next year's uh, award are, on, are available on the, ver on the tables here. So feel free to, to take one. Those nominations are then vetted by a committee that is made up of representatives from each of the undergraduate professional colleges, as well as four members from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I'd like to introduce those, the members of that committee. So first is Professor Brett Wilmot, the Associate Director of the Ethics Program. Maybe you can just stand up when I say your name. Of course, it's not clear to me that no one know, that, that people don't know who you are already. <laughs> um, Professor Barbara Ott, College of Nursing. Professor Frank Falcone, College of Engineering. Professor Brian Ota of the Chemistry Department. Professor Karen Hollis of the Department of English. And this is the first time that Professor Hollis has been able to come to this because she's always teaching. So I'm glad you're here. And then Professor Nick Rangione from the Villanova School of Business who sends his regrets. I serve as the chair of the selection committee. So we let, met last April and looked through our nominations and Jennifer is the choice. So it's our tradition to ask the person who nominates someone for this award to introduce the recipient. So this year's recipient was nominated by Professor Sue Toten, member of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and the coordinator of Villanova University's partnership with Catholic Relief Services. So I invite Professor Toten to introduce our honored guest. I'm so happy that I'm not on your selection committee because I get to nominate the wonderful people like Jennifer Stiff Clark. Um, it's my privilege to introduce you to Jennifer Staple Clark. Uh, in 2000, Jennifer Staple Clark, then a sophomore at Yale University, founded Unite for Sight in her dorm room. So I say to my students, look, what are you doing? <laughs> sophomore year, get with it, you know, with a program. Due to Jennifer's leadership and her focus on entrepreneurial innovation, Unite for Sight is a leader in providing cost-effective care to the world's poorest people. By investing in human and financial resources in the social ventures of eye clinics in developing countries, Unite for Sight has provided eye care to more than 1.6 million people living in extreme poverty, including more than 64,000 sight-restoring surgeries. Additionally, Unite for Sight's Global Health 
uh, University and Global Impact Core programs develop and nurture the next generation of global health leaders. Unite for Sight also coordinates an annual Global Health and Innovation Conference coming up next week, which convenes 2,200 participants, so that's a goal for me, right? Uh, and is the world's largest global health and social entrepreneurship conference. Jennifer is the recipient of the 2011 John F. Kennedy New Frontiers Award presented by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and the Institute of Politics at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government to an individual whose contributions in the realm of community service, advocacy, or grassroots activism have elevated the debate or changed the landscape with respect to a public issue or issues. She also received the American Institute of Public Services in 2009 National Jefferson Award for Public Service, which is regarded as a Nobel Prize for Public Service. In 2007, she was awarded a Brick Award, which honors and funds change makers who identify problems and work to change the world. She's also been featured in the book, Our Time Is Now, Young People Changing the World, as well as many other publications. She's the author of journal articles and book chapters about social entrepreneurship best practices in global health and community eye health. Additionally, she's a member of the Yale University's President Council on International Activities, and she resides in Connecticut with her husband and their young son. Seven years ago, I was teaching my course, which I teach regularly, on global poverty and justice in the theology and religious studies department, and assigned a group project to my students. And the project was essentially to research some of the ways their professions are contributing to reducing global poverty and its effects. I met with groups, groups of students in the very beginning to help them brainstorm. And uh, one of those groups was a group of aspiring healthcare professionals. And the conversation went like this, other than some individual nurses and physicians who volunteer in clinics um, or Doctors Without Borders, um, we really don't see our profession addressing the healthcare needs of poor and marginalized people. Well, that's, I, I know that's changed over the years, so that was way back. Um, but one of the things they said that troubled me was that uh, they felt that students in the healthcare field were not all that interested in using their skills to address the needs of uh, poor and marginalized people. And I said, I don't think that's, I think you're wrong. I think, I think you're, maybe your vision is a little limited. Um, and as I probed a little more, I saw that this was their concern. This was their passion. And so I knew of the Unite for Sight. I knew of the Unite for Sight. And I knew that the conference was coming up at Yale. And I said, come on, we're going to go. And so I raised funds. And we got a van. And we got a, a motel. And uh, I said, I want to go with you because I've heard about this conference and I think it's important for you to be there and I think it's important for me to be there to see this um, so that I can um, help other students. So uh, we got there, we got to Yale, and the students were expecting roughly 100, 200 you know, people. And they were absolutely flabbergasted by the fact that there were 2,200 participants. And they were also flabbergasted that some of the speakers that we were, some of the books that we were reading in class, the authors, were the major speakers. Jeffrey Sachs, Mok Mukherjee uh, from Partners in Health. And uh, the program itself was just packed. Uh, and uh, it's coming up again next week. And I just want to tell you some of the, give you a sense of the program. Education initiatives in global health, environment, energy, and agriculture. Uh, healthcare delivery models and impact measurement, health policy and advocacy, maternal and child health. Uh, what was exciting to me was that there were medical schools who were there, uh, who were doing presentations. So this was thrilling for my students and it was thrilling for me. Um, and out, one of the outcomes, we were always talking about outcomes, one of our students, Caitlin Ingraham, was a Unite for Sight Global Impact volunteer in Tegucigalpa, uh, Nicaragua. And Sean DeWolf, one of the students that I took to that conference, is now in medical school after volunteering for a year in Mexico, in a clinic in Mexico. 
So to Jennifer Staple-Clark, I want to say that your work has been incredibly significant. It's been significant in, trans in transforming the lives of poor and marginalized people. It's been significant in transforming uh, the lives of aspiring healthcare professionals, transforming educational institutions that train healthcare professionals, uh, transforming the healthcare profession itself. And what matters, I think, for me, what's so significant is that you have advanced the basic truth uh, in our global society. Uh, something that Paul Farmer says over and over again, that medicine and medical care fundamentally belong to the sick. They have a right to it, and not simply to those who can afford to pay for it. So you raise the standard for our students, you raise the standard for us here at Villanova, and we'd like to join with you in your effort of advancing the basic right of all human beings to medical care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Now, it's become a tradition at this event to um, hear as well from people who um, either know or and or benef have benefited from the work of the person receiving the Praxis Award, and today is no different. So I'd like to introduce two people. One, as I mentioned, is uh, coming to us from Ghana um, via video. I was trying to do, well, I will tell you that later. Um, so I just want to introduce Dave Casper. Dave Casper is a Villanova alum, College of Engineering. He's now in medical school in Philadelphia. But after graduation, right, Dave? Uh, he was also a global health volunteer for Unite for Sight. So he's here to share with us. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dorley for having me out. It's always good to be back at the alma mater, of course. Um, so as Dr. Dorley mentioned, uh, I had the great opportunity of volunteering with Unite for Sight. Um, and uh, I'd like to just share a few of my experiences with the program. Um, I was a graduate back in uh, 2008. And uh, much to the dismay of my parents, I did not have a job lined up, um, no real career plans. And I guess like a lot of kids in my generation, I uh, look for my answer on the internet. Um, so that's where I stumbled across Unite for Sight's website. And uh, I think initially, I don't think I had the most altruistic values in mind when I thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll get over to Africa, I'll check out another culture, and uh, maybe I'll just get my parents off my back for a little bit. <laughs> um, so soon enough, I was on a plane headed over to Ghana, and uh, I have to say, every day I spent over there was just unbelievable. Um, I landed, I was picked up by uh, one of the coordinators there who handles the logistics. They dropped me off at where I was going to be staying, um, and I got to meet all the other volunteers. And uh, all the volunteers I worked with were fantastic, um, all great people. And so from a volunteer's perspective, uh, what exactly it is that we do is we would wake up in the mornings and we would travel about an hour to several hours outside of the main city where we were based. Um, and so in Ghana, I was in Accra and also a city in the north. Um, so we would travel a few hours outside the city. And uh, what we would do is we would set up uh, eye screening clinics at churches or local community centers. Um, and so to make sure that we had patients that day, uh, a representative from Unite for Sight would go out the week beforehand and they would sort of get the word out, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be by in a week, please come by if you have any concerns about your eyes. And so normally when we would arrive, there would be many people waiting, um, sometimes often hundreds outside the churches waiting for their free screenings. And so from the volunteer, we had three real roles. The first of which was we would establish uh, a baseline vision screening. So I'm sure all of you know those little eye charts that you have at the doctor's office. So one of us would establish the baseline vision and then the patient would then be passed along to the optometrist where they could uh, diagnose any underlying pathology or prescribe any medications. And from there they would go to the second volunteer who would then dispense these medications or book them for surgery or anything like that. And then the last role of the volunteer would be um, to fit them for any sort of reading glasses and provide them with sunglasses. And I thought real briefly I'd just walk you through one patient experience that I had while over there, um, just so you can better understand exactly what it is that the volunteers do. 
Um, so we had uh, an, elderly, an elderly gentleman um, walk in one day. He must have been in his old, late 60s, early 70s, and he was being led by his grandson. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Um, so he was being led by his grandson, because clearly his, his vision was gone. He couldn't see. Um, so his grandson served as his chaperone. And uh, as he sat down, I approached him to do the, the general eye exam to get a baseline vision. And uh, he really couldn't see much of anything. In fact, all he could really see was he could detect a little bit of light from my pen light. And other than that, he couldn't see a thing. Um, and he said this had been ongoing for you know, a decade or so. So really, it's been quite some time. And so I sent him over to our optometrist, and he quickly diagnosed him as having pretty severe cataracts. Now, I know that's a diagnosis that a lot of you have heard before, but really, in a country like this, you know, it never gets to that sort of degree, right? We treat it as soon as there's a little change in vision, it's treated. So this poor gentleman, he couldn't see anything at all. Um, so we scheduled him for surgery, and uh, it's a little bit of a logistics in terms of transporting him to the city where the procedure's actually done, but so we set all that up, and I had the good fortune of getting the opportunity to be at the gentleman's surgery. Um, so I was shadowing the ophthalmologist that day, and I saw his surgery, and it was uneventful. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't there when the patches were removed but I heard from the, uh, a colleague that, um, you know, he's overcome with joy. He had full restoration of his eyesight. And uh, I think I was so caught up in the whirlwind of the culture and the experience that the magnitude of that really didn't set in with me until I was on the plane flight home. And I was sort of sitting there and I was thinking, you know, here's a gentleman who for 10 plus years had no vision, right? And he resigned himself to the fact that this is going to be what my life is like. And within a few weeks, of meeting the Unite for Sight organization. He was seen, he was evaluated, he was treated, and he was treated successfully. And in a few weeks, this man had full restoration of his vision. And when you think about it, not only does it impact him, but it impacts his village as well, right? Now, there's another contributing member. And additionally, I thought about, you know, his grandson, who was his chaperone. You know, he wasn't at school. He wasn't helping out anywhere else. He was chaperoning his grandfather because you know, that's what a good grandson does, right? So now he's freed up to go to school and do all these other things. And you think about the systemic effect and the amount of benefit that has for the village in general. It's, it's tough to measure. Um, and so briefly last night, it's been a while since I've been back on the Unite for Sight website, but I saw that uh, they've seen and evaluated over 1.5 million patients and conducted over 63,000 surgeries. I mean, and that, those numbers to me are just staggering. And it goes to show clearly the global impact that Unite for Sight is having. All those individual surgeries are all an individual story. And it's truly just a fantastic organization. And uh, I'd like to thank Jennifer Le for letting me get the opportunity and the privilege to volunteer with them. So thank you very much. And uh, I can think of no one more deserving of this award. Thank you. Okay, so now we have this visitor from Ghana. How do I get this going again? Oh, I need your password. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer's uh, admi administrative assistant, um, whose name is escaping me right now, Rachel, um, arranged this for me. I, I asked her, I, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to use Skype and have the person actually talking to us, and, uh, but it didn't work. Couldn't, couldn't make that happen. So we have this video. I just warn you, the video is about seven minutes long. The first couple minutes is simply, um, there's no, really no one talking. They're giving you a sense of what one of these clinics looks like in the village.
church and I'm a teacher by profession. I teach English and literature, literature, literature in English. And for the past three years, I've not seen any problem. And there were a lot of medical examinations, but all good things are. Every hard admission, I'm going to do my master's because I could not see properly. I have to defend my course. So at the long run, somebody directed me to critical, critical eye clinic in Chabang Center. When I came, the doctors being patients, they examined me and they got to know that my right eye had developed a cataract and therefore I needed a surgical operation. So on 8 March 2012, we were taken to uh, Accra, where Gregor Myers will be coming, sighted. Then uh, we had the the surgical operation. Lo and behold, I could see properly. Immediately, they removed the plasma from my eyes. I could see properly, I could read, I could do everything. So I got to know that all hopes were not lost. So they were, I was given some instructions to follow so that the, the, the eye can heal very fast. So did you pay for the surgery? I did not pay for the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told that I was unit for science, United for science, United for science, the second And I'm very happy, I'm very happy, and I thank them very much. But I couldn't afford, afford the, 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 the surgery. The surgery. Mm -hmm. And then how has the, the surgery affected your life? Has it changed anything? Your profession has it made, made any impact? Doctor, as I said, it has helped me a lot. As a language teacher, I need to read and bear the pin that for you. Then go and teach my students who are part of your students. Uh, it has helped me a lot. So now I can read clearly. I can even read without reading the text. Uh, I have hard books before me. I read everything. And the students also enjoy my, my teaching. From that moment, from that onwards, I'm very, you know, psychologically, I'm now mentally sound because I was always worried. I was going to go blind. I was way down, but now I'm very happy. I can see, I can do everything. And I'm very proud of United Science for the good work they are doing. Your resources have not been in vain. Doctors are working so assiduously to see to me that everybody who comes here will gain this or a sight. I really appreciate the good work that And what I can say is that God richly bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bala. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel, for getting for that for us. Did you, did you know George by any chance, Jennifer? No, I don't know. Okay, all right. So, uh, without further ado, can I ask you to come up here? I'd like to present you with this award. So, the first thing I'd like to give you is a clock. It says Villanova University. It says the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics, Jennifer Staple Clark, in recognition of her commitment to professional integrity, presented this fourth day of April 2013, the Ethics Program, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Congratulations. And also, but no less important, $1,000 honorarium, which is she asked us to give to make the check out to Unite for Sight. Thank you so much. It's such an extraordinary honor to be receiving this award and also to have the privilege to meet so many of these your remarkable faculty and students. And I so appreciate the wonderful, kind words and 
also want to discuss a little bit about the remarkable local doctors that we work to support. And of course, you had met George, one of the patients in the video. And the local doctors we work with are working every day tirelessly throughout the year to provide care to so many patients like George who are otherwise unable to access and afford care, living in villages sometimes as far away as eight hours from the closest eye clinic. And a few of those just remarkably, genuinely dedicated doctors include uh, Dr. Seth Wanye, who it has been the only ophthalmologist for two million people in the entire northern region of Ghana since 2004. And before that, before 2004 and before Dr. Wanye went to Tamale in northern Ghana, there was not a single ophthalmologist. And when Dr. Wanye first arrived, he was not able to provide any cataract surgeries because the patients were living in such extreme poverty in northern Ghana that they couldn't afford care. And also there were very few who even knew that eye care was a possibility for them. So he actually, Dr. Wanya used to travel back down to the capital to work with his colleagues about 12 hours away just to keep up his surgical skills because there were no surgical patients for him up in northern Ghana. In around 2005, Unite for Sight was able to connect with him and from that time, in the first few years, he was providing about 300 surgeries each year to patients living in extreme poverty, and he was so excited to be able to reach so many patients. And he continued building up his, the local capacity of his local clinic and his local staff, and was developing amazing strategies to be able to reach the hardest to reach patients. The patients who didn't know that they could even receive eye care, that a, site, a surgery, for example, could restore their sight. And remarkably, in 2012, he provided more than 4,100 sight restoring cataract surgeries, and which is just a remarkable number. And I'm not even sure if there are any other ophthalmologists in the world who are providing that many surgeries. And he's been able to do that because he is going into the villages and able to identify so many patients who have eye care issues. And he's also been able to gain the trust of so many of those village patients who may have been fearful, for example, of medical care, but they see then that their friends and family are coming back with restored sight because of Dr. Wanye's surgical skills. And they too then decide to follow through and have cataract surgery and go from being oftentimes completely blind to having their sight entirely restored and then be able to contribute to their families and to their communities and villages. So Dr. Seth Wanye, other doctors we work with, for example, Dr. James Clark similarly is providing about 3,000 sight restoring surgeries. And oftentimes he emails me to tell me around midnight Ghana time that he's just finished about 50 surgeries in one day. And such an extraordinary dedication to want to provide this care for patients living in poverty who would otherwise not be able to receive the care. And you had also heard on that video uh, in the background, the person interviewing George, his name is Ernest, who is an optometrist working with Crystal Eye Clinic, going every day into the villages, traveling about one to three hours, sometimes up to eight hours away to provide that care. And he oftentimes, similar to this video, he oftentimes sends stories back to Unite for Sight and also to past volunteers and upcoming volunteers about really unique individuals who have had their sight restored. And one of the recent stories he sent along was about a young boy who should have been in the equivalent of fifth grade in Ghana, but he was actually staying back each year. He was still in first grade because he was struggling so much in school. And people thought of him, he described people, all of his peers thought that he was just very stupid, that he couldn't pass that first grade. And eventually the teacher realized that maybe it was a vision problem that was impacting him. So he was then told to go with his mother to receive eye care from Ernest. So he went and it turned out that he actually had uh, bilateral cataracts. So that was why he was doing so poorly in school. It wasn't because he was stupid, which is what people were saying, but it was because he couldn't see. So a few weeks later, he had his sight restoring cataract surgery by Dr. James Clark, the local Ghanaian ophthalmologist. And then Ernest saw him again for his post-operative care about a month later. And the young boy said to Ernest that he's so excited, he wants to go back to school and show everyone how smart he actually is. And he was so excited to be able to do that. And there's so many extraordinary stories like that, that we are constantly hearing from those local doctors. And those, it's such a privilege and honor to have the opportunity to support those local doctors as they are providing quality care to the local patients within their community and country. 
So thank you so much for this extraordinary honor and on behalf of all of the local doctors that we work with and the patients who are receiving care. I so appreciate it. Thank you.